Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, continuing our series. Uh, I just wanted to give a plug. You should have received one of these with the bulletin. Uh, this is the booklet we pulled together of uh, many of the stories um, that uh, were generated from our Faith Raiser event that we did throughout the summer. And uh, in, in addition, there's a, a bit of an exhortation that I wrote, uh, as well as uh, all of the stories that you turned in. There's other stories that people are still uh, coming and, and sharing, and we're still seeing uh, uh, money come in as a result. Again, the primary purpose was to raise faith. When you read these stories, uh, you see people taking a step of faith, doing something. Often they'll communicate how they didn't know what to do, or they weren't sure if it would work, and then God came through, and they saw uh, their 20 or uh, 30 or 40 dollars multiplied, uh, many of them, uh, many, many times over. And in fact, uh, we received about 300% return in just five months. That's better than any bank. <laughs> Can you imagine, you put $100 in the bank and you had a 300% return in five months? Then I'd like banks more. I have a problem with banks, but no. <laughs> it's just more all the money. Anyway, so it's a great uh, tool, a great uh, thing that we, that we pull together, and I encourage you to read through it. Um, we've been going on a year-long journey of spiritual growth using the illustration or metaphor of, a, of, of the inward uh, journey, the upward journey, and the outward journey. Um, and uh, it's important to know that the inward journey and the upward journey is really meant to equip and empower us for this outward journey. And that's what we're taking this last part of the year. I'm just really excited uh, that uh, it's kind of like I'm feeling the momentum that, uh, that we've been building all year. To, and understand that all of that which came before leads to the importance of priority of this outward journey. And our theme verse for this uh, section is found in John 20, 21. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And just <clears throat> we mentioned this earlier in the previous sermon, but the impact that that must have had on those disciples when Jesus himself was saying that to them, and they had, they had personally witnessed Jesus' life, his, the miracles, his teaching, the feeding of the thousands, the people being raised from the dead, but then also Jesus' arrest, Jesus' crucifixion, and then his resurrection. And, and so when they heard those words, it was a very powerful, powerful uh, uh, you know, statement. And the truth of the matter is, what we're trying to communicate to you is that Jesus is saying that to you and I. That the outward journey is being sent uh, by Jesus in the same way that Jesus was sent by the Father. And today, in this month in October, we're talking about church's mission um, and, uh, and uh, tying in an understanding of how, how church works into this outward journey and how it fits into our journey, our spiritual journey, the our journey is fulfilling our purpose as God's people. Right? And it's, it's important to understand that it is as essential, uh, uh, it is as essential to the gospel as personal salvation. In other words, you know, often there's an emphasis, such an emphasis on personal salvation. And that's good. We want people to get saved, right? <clears throat> Without that, we wouldn't have a church, right? That's what we exist. That's kind of like the goal. It's, 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 it's kind of weird. Because <clears throat> it's the goal, but it's not the goal. Because okay? the goal is not just to get saved and wait for heaven. Because right. right? if that, you know, if you get saved, then, then you might as well just die and go to heaven. <laughs> it's saved. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's saved unto something. All right? We're saved unto something, not just saved from something. We're saved, we're saved from death and hell, praise God, from sin. That's great. But there's, a, there's more to it. We're saved unto God's eternal purpose. So that's what we're going to be talking about uh, this month. I thought Graham did a fantastic job last week talking about the identity and the authority of God. I love, if you want here, you should listen to the podcast. Um, you know, the church is, is not the building. We all know that. Uh, and uh, people say, it's not the building, it's the people. And, and that's true, but not fully true. It's people, the, the Greek word, ecclesia, 
means people gathered together for a purpose. All right? And we are the people of God gathered together for a purpose. That's when we're the church. We're Christians individually. We're Christians when we, when we uh, greet one another. We're always, always Christians. But when we gather together for a purpose, a God purpose, then we are, we are functioning and we are existing as the church. And we're looking at Acts, the book of Acts, the church in the book of Acts, um, as the template for the outward journey. And the big idea we want you to take away from this month, from October, is that church is God's means of accomplishing the great commission. We're going to explain what that is. Uh, church is a community with a specific purpose. And in Acts, throughout the book of Acts, a beautiful story uh, of, of the people of God realizing and stepping into and living out what they're now called to. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, as Graham said, it's the hinge pinge of the New Testament transfer, trans, uh, transitioning us from the message of Jesus, the story of Jesus' life, into how the church after the resurrection uh, walks out or lives out. And really, as you read through it, they discover how to make it work. And it then becomes the template for uh, what we are to be as the church today. But first I want you to understand what we mean by a new creation model. What, what in the world are we talking about? So let's talk about the original creation. And that is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Of course, it's the whole Genesis 1, 2, 3. But there's a powerful statement. In fact, this is the first command that God gives humanity. Human, humankind. It says, God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on earth. So the very first command is to be uh, fruitful and fill the earth and have dominion over it. So from the beginning, God's been, God wasn't ever intended that Adam and Eve to stay in the garden. Right? They were, they were commissioned to fill the whole earth. So right from the beginning, mankind had a commission to go and to fill and to rule. So this was really the first great commission. Uh, in this creation, the original creation, every person, every man, every human came from that one man, Adam. But because of sin, and the old story you can read through it, because of sin, that, uh, that race, the, everyone that came from Adam and Eve, they became fractured and fragmented. They became divided and ultimately very, very destructive. Right? And you see wars and death and that happening as a result of sin. So everyone came from one man, but because of sin, they ended up fracturing into, and fragmenting into uh, division and destruction. But, just because that happened, it didn't annul God's command. Right? To fill and subdue the earth still was the command. And God had a plan that enables mankind to fulfill that command. In fact, he repeats it to Noah after the violence had gotten so bad in the earth, God sends a flood, and uh, you know, the entire humanity is wiped out except for one family, Noah and his, uh, his uh, uh, daughters and sons-in-law. And, um, <clears throat> and after they spend 40, how long was it? 40 days. No. Yeah. 40 days? How could I not remember that? <laughs> they were, the, the rain lasted for 40 days, but they were in a boat for like a year and a half. I don't know, it was a long time. Uh, quite, quite a long time. <laughs> because they had to dry, right? And then they came out of um, the ark finally, and God said to them, same command, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So even after sin, even after destruction, God's command persisted. All right, and let's, let's continue on. Same command to Abraham, found in Genesis 22. By myself, I have sworn, this is God speaking, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and not withheld your son, your only son, this is when uh, Abraham was called to take the, the son of promise, Isaac, up to the mountain, and God said, sacrifice your son, and he did it, he laid him on the altar, and he lifted up the knife, and an angel appeared and stopped him, and, but he was willing, 
to sacrifice his son. And then, then, then they look and there's a, there's a, a, a lamb in the thicket that had been stopped. And so God provided the lamb. And so it's just an amazing illustration of what God actually did do in sending his son to die for us. But, uh, to Abraham, he said, because you were willing uh, to, uh, and not withhold your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gates of their enemies in your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. One man being obedient to the, to the end results in a blessing to all nations. Right? And this is the same commission to reach the ends of the earth, to have dominion over all of the earth. And this promise is repeated. It's like a refrain. It's like a chorus. You think of the Bible as a song. It's like a chorus that is repeated to go to the ends of the earth and have dominion, to rule over it. It's repeated specifically to a number of Abraham's descendants, um, and, uh, you know, uh, that there, through them, there would come uh, the deliverer. It's the promise of the new creation. And we see this in the New Testament fulfilled, and Paul explains it to the uh, in Galatians. Um, for you are also, and this is speeding forward, so the, the whole Old Testament is the story of Abraham's descendants um, living out in the world this call to be God's people. And you know, they didn't do it perfectly, did they? <laughs> they struggled, and we struggled, and that's part of the story of being God's people, is learning how to follow. But the call, the commission never changed. And then uh, once Christ comes, we understand in the new covenant that it really hasn't changed it's being fulfilled in a way that they didn't fully understand in the old covenant so you are all songs paul's writing to the church now uh, this is after jesus's life death and resurrection uh, this is now many years uh, after and there are churches scattered throughout uh, europe he's writing to one of them or this is in asia you are all sons of god through faith in christ jesus for as many of you as were baptized, boom, boom, tying into the service, into Christ, have put on Christ, uh, this is, uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So ethnic divisions don't exist in the kingdom of God. We're brought, it doesn't mean that we don't have ethnicity, all right? Ethnicity is wonderful. I love it. Okay? I love other cultures. That's why I travel around the world so much. <laughs> it's, it's such a blessing that every culture has a rich inheritance. And in, in heaven, you read Revelations, it, it talks about the, the, the multitude singing from, in every tongue and from every nation. Right? This is a very important verse. That means that people are singing in different languages in heaven. You know what that means? That means that we keep our ethnicity, that we keep the good part, uh, the, the beneficial part, the part that is reflective of God's character um, in our ethnicity when we're in heaven. We're not all homogenous and, and, and turned into people that look like us. Thank God. Right? <laughs> this is really important to understand that, that that's a valued thing. There's worship to God in every language. It's funny. When we get to heaven, American Christians are going to be so surprised when they get to heaven. So these American uh, 20, 21st century Christians, when they get to heaven, they find out the, the amount of time given to hill songs, you know, and Jesus culture songs. You know, they have to wait a thousand years because they got songs in Hebrew and songs in ancient Aramaic and songs in, you know, Chinese. You know, there's more, there's going to be more Chinese believers than the rest of the world within our lifetime, all right? <laughs> There's more Christians today on planet Earth that don't speak English than, than they do by far. And, and over the, uh, the course of the last 2,000 years, we're a minority, okay? Well, that's going to be great. It's going to be a glorious minority. But in one sense, we're not a minority because we're all one. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> Why? Because we've been baptized into Christ. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. Boom! 
and heirs according to the promise. That promise, what promise? The promise that God gave to Abraham. Right? The command that God gave to Adam and Eve. <coughs> that we are one and we're going to conquer this new creation. Uh, in the new creation, the fragmented, divided humanity is brought back together into one man. And the old creation who came out of one man and became fractured and divided. And the new creation we come into Christ. And in Christ, we find unity. We find wholeness. We find our purpose. And that's what the church is. And it's glorious. Amen? Ah! I love this. I'm really excited about this message. <laughs> so you guys need to be more excited because I'm excited. <laughs> well, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me. This is uh, Jesus' last words before he ascended uh, in the book of Matthew. It's repeated again in several other places. So he's giving his disciples uh, his last words and commissioning them. He says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I don't know, uh, here it is again repeated in Acts. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the renewed Great Commission. I don't know if when you read this, if you see it, but when I read this, I hear the original command to Adam and Eve. To fill, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Uh, originally to Adam and his spouse Eve, now to Christ and his spouse, the church, his bride, the church. We are called to fulfill that first great commission, the new commission, is that we are called to bring people, not just have children, that's great, have a lot of kids, but to bring people, have spiritual kids. Uh, <laughs> some people take that literally, it's all right. <laughs> uh, but also to have spiritual kids by sharing the, uh, the, the gospel and inviting them into relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, um, so this is the pattern we see then played out through the book of Acts. And, uh, and that uh, verse in Acts 1 is really the template for the book of Acts uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth is, is how the story goes uh, in the book of Acts. Acts actually covers between 30 and 40 years. You know, we read a book like Acts, and we read a few chapters, and we think it all happens over the course of a few days. Um, you have to maybe pull out a uh, uh, Bible dictionary, and uh, or do what I do, which is Google uh, timeline for Acts, and it'll tell you what year each each event happened. And so the Book of Acts actually covers thirty to forty years of history, and the first seven chapters is almost all. It's almost all in Jerusalem, which is in, is in Judea. So it's it's just them being witnesses in Jerusalem. We see thousands of people saved. We see persecution happen. And then in chapter 8, it spreads to Samaria. So people get saved up there, and there's uh, basically a revival breaks out. And then a really important chapter of turning uh, of, the, of the whole uh, story it happens in chapter 9 and 10. Saul, who was a uh, Jew, persecuting the church because he was zealous for God. He was going from city to city, arresting uh, those who were believers in Christ and making, getting them in prison. And uh, he gets converted, and then Peter experiences that vision. You can read about in, in chapter uh, 9 and 10 of Acts, where uh, the angel comes down, or the vision comes down, and basically it convinces Peter that the gospel is for all people. And we cannot withhold it. Right after that, this Roman soldier calls him to his house, Cornelius. And Cornelius was part of the Italian regiment. Okay, can you imagine? A bunch of Italian guys. <laughs> a bunch of Italian soldiers, right? The mob, yeah. <laughs> and the mob, all these Italians, uh, invite Peter to come, this Jew, and so Peter goes into a, a, an Italian household, which in and of itself would have been a taboo, 
and the, and the Jewish culture to have a meal with them, and he, and he starts talking to them, the Holy Ghost falls on them, and they all start speaking in tongues, and they get saved, and they, and they get baptized. It's amazing what happens. It's powerful. What's going on here? This has stunned the church. This is years in, actually, uh, to the story that, oh my goodness, all these, all these Gentiles are being saved. Because initially, they, many of the disciples thought this was a Jewish thing. This was just uh, an, another revival of the Jewish religion. But increasingly, they're saying, this is something new. All right? this, is, this is way bigger. Way bigger. And the rest of the story of Acts is the church, mostly led by Paul, Going from town to town, city to city, region to region, preaching the gospel. He ends up going up into Asia, he goes as far as Rome, uh, church tradition, then he goes as far as Spain, <clears throat> preaching and planting churches everywhere he went. And so we're just going to read a couple of stories uh, from Acts where he does this. It says, uh, then news of these things, this is news of what uh, was happening in the other cities. This is the first one is Antioch. Um, news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. Oh, so the church was in Jerusalem, but stuff's happening up north in Antioch, another city. And so they sent out Barnabas to go check it out. He was one of their faithful teachers, a good uh, leader in the church. So they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. And when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all with a purpose of heart. They should continue with the Lord, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Paul or Saul. <clears throat> Saul had been converted. He was living back, living in Tarsus. He spent a, a number of years after his salvation just to get rooted and solid and understand his faith. And Barnabas said, "We need this Saul guy. He's a really good teacher. We need him to come down." Here. So he went and got him, brought him back to Antioch. Uh, when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was. For a whole year, they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. All right, I believe this was around 40 or 42 A.D. So this is about seven years after Jesus' resurrection. They weren't called Christians yet. And so it had been seven years. And, and, and it was, I think it's significant that it's once uh, um, the church actually got past that first uh, call, the call to reach to be a witness in Jerusalem, and then they're actually starting to be the church by spreading the message outward and, and being in Antioch, that they, they are now given this new name, Christian. And, and it's, it's very important to understand that word. It's kind of just a label. It's just bannered about that uh, uh, it means someone in Christ. You know, it's someone who's living in Christ. Because that's what, and why would they call that? Because that's what they were talking about. That's what the outsiders started calling them. Oh, it's those Christians. Because they're always talking about this Christ. And Peter said during uh, <coughs> worship that Steve Brasillo, that we're to preach Jesus. Well, that's our main thing. So the early church did that to the point where the outsiders started calling them Christians, people who are in Christ, because that was the, the primary message that they were communicating. And that happened not in Jerusalem, not in Judea, but the, or even Samaria, up in the hand. And they're actually going out into the Gentile world. Later in Acts, we see more of this story unfold. Paul has reached Poseidon, Poseidia, actually you read in Acts, it's Antioch of Poseidia, which is another town called Antioch. <laughs> and so you have, to, you have to do a little research here. It's a different city that the first Antioch is in the very southern of what we now call Syria. Um, this Antioch is in central Syria, uh, quite, a, quite a far ways up. <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas grew bold. They, they went out from Antioch and were planting other churches. We're going to other uh, cities in that region, and uh, they got really bold and said it was and it was preaching the gospel. And they, they, their pattern was to first go to the synagogue, the Jewish teaching place in any city, because those people had kind of a basis to understand uh, the message. They were preaching from the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written; <laughs> it hadn't been fully written yet, and so. <clears throat> 
as they're preaching, it says, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, you being the Jewish people in the city. But since you reject it, they rejected the, the message and, and, and were causing a ruckus, and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, and then he quotes from the Old Testament. Okay? In other words, the commission hasn't changed. We're just fulfilling the command that you were given. Right? We're walking in the same uh, commission. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles. That was originally spoken to the people of Israel. It was really spoken to the people of God. Right? And because that, that verse in Galatians, we understand that now we are sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. And so I have said you, that you now comes to us as a light to the Gentile, that you should be for the salvations to the ends of the earth. Now when the Gentiles heard this, wow, they were glad. Woo, we get in on this. All right. Uh, and they glorified uh, the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout the whole region. So you see the message of the gospel exploding out, crossing over ethnic divisions, geographic divisions, economic divisions. All divisions are need to be submitted to the unity that we have in the message of the gospel. Another story in Ephesus, which is in Acts 19. Yeah, which... We've been to. <laughs> um, you can go and see Ephesus because um, a number of years after this uh, was written over, actually, I don't know, a year, probably a century or two, uh, due to weather changes. Um, it was, a, was an ocean port, a very busy, major city in the Roman Empire. Uh, but when we were there, like, the ocean is nowhere around, man. It's crazy. It's the middle of the desert. <laughs> and... Uh, but, uh, so because it all dried up, everybody left, and unlike a lot of uh, cities in that region, uh, most of it was still there. You could actually walk down the street, you could walk in some of the buildings. Obviously the roofs are gone, uh, but the pillars are, are still there. We actually stood uh, in the very place that Paul was preaching the gospel. It was quite powerful. So they heard this. Um, they were baptized, so Paul went to the city in Ephesus, and again, as he did in every place, he begins uh, preaching the gospel. Some people heard it. They were baptized in the name of, you know, I didn't plan this out, that we were having a baptism service, okay? This message was set almost a year ago when we, when we outlined the messages. <laughs> it just happened that we had a baptism. I didn't realize how many times I referenced baptism in this. In the sermon. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Boom! You know, salvation, baptism, being filled with the Holy Spirit, really, biblically, it usually happens in one swoop. And some of, for some of us, it takes years, and that's okay too, but it's all available. Even prophesied. They just started speaking out forth the word of God. So now let me read this. Now the men were about 12 in all. So this huge city, it's a major city in the Roman Empire. There's only 12 people that Paul met. But he invested into those 12. And they go into the synagogue and speak boldly. He spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And he skipped over the part where they, the people in the synagogue get all mad and kick him out of the synagogue. So he goes down the road and continued for two years in Ephesus, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. With 12 people in two years, the whole of that region, all of Asia, which would be all of what we call uh, most of Turkey, the, the eastern Turkey, Syria, Iraq, that whole region, heard the word of God. Why? Because Ephesus was a major uh, economic uh, center, so people were coming and going, and they would train up disciples and send them to the nearby cities and, and start churches. And so from that church of 12, it actually grew substantially. And uh, we, we believe from church history that the church in Ephesus at one point got up to 30,000 people. 30,000! That's like Joel Olstein. 
<laughs> they met in an auditorium, a sport that was used both for sports and concerts, right? Uh, so the whole manager thing, it's not new, guys. <laughs> it's first century church. But they also met in small groups, in houses, and in the, in the smaller towns. They were just uh, house churches. It didn't matter whether there were 12 or 12,000. They were preaching the gospel, and they were being the church called unto a purpose. And that purpose was to communicate the gospel to everyone they encountered. So this pattern that we see in Acts is very, very important. And, uh, and it's a template for the church today. Right? It's a template. It's a, it's the, this is what we're supposed to be doing, church. Now, everybody has a different definition. They bring into church, uh, just like when you come to a faith or you encounter a Christian, if you're not a Christian, if you're raised in the church, out of the church, you have, you have a preconception uh, of what Christianity is, and you have a preconception of what the church is. But we need to have a biblical perception of what the church is. And the biblical perception of the church is, is laid out very clearly in Acts that they were outward bound, okay? that they were compelled. And in fact, uh, many people think that uh, much of the persecution in Jerusalem, some people say it, it happened because they weren't getting out quick enough. And so the, the, the God allowed persecution to happen so that people had to flee. And when they fled into other cities, they found out, gosh, Gentiles like this message too. And the church spread. And we're called to spread the gospel wherever we go. And if we're not going to places, we need to get up and go. All right? Go to the streets. Come on. It's a fantastic. It's a free mission trip. All right? Come to me to Japan. That's not free. It's 2800 bucks. <laughs> okay? uh, uh, <clears throat> go to the streets. Go preach the gospel. And Paul explains, and so Titus is the main actually text of the, of the sermon today, is that Paul explains what he did throughout the whole book of Acts. Uh, this is later. He probably wrote this when he was in Rome to the church in Ephesus. Uh, or possibly when he was in one of the other cities. But this is him writing a letter back to that church that he started. And it was that for several years. Explaining why. This is the reasoning behind all that we see Paul doing throughout the book of Acts. He says, he, God, made known to me that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, the body of Jesus Christ, and partakers of his promise, the promise uh, of Abraham, the promise throughout all of Scripture, through the gospel. So through this message, we call the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, and we can be forgiven of our sins, if we confess faith in Jesus Christ, repent of our sinful acts, and commit to live with him, and are baptized, we, through the gospel, we become partakers of the promise, and we become of the same body, regardless of our history, regardless of our background, uh, um, that we can have a future of the promise. Of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so Paul just saw this as his calling. is to just talk about the riches of Christ. Okay? Everything that is included in the, in the message and in the person and the relationship that's offered with Jesus Christ. That, that Paul said, man, this is, this is a grace. This is the, the call that he had. And listen, this is the call that's given to the church. All right? Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ in another place. Was, do what you see me do. And what Paul did was he would preach to anybody that would listen. Actually, he preached to people that quit the lesson. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Until they kicked him out. And he preached to somebody else. He was a pit bull. Yeah, right? <laughs> he just didn't stop. And maybe you, you're not, doesn't mean that you have to have his personality. Uh, you can preach in a different way. But you're communicating the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people in all places. And if you can't find a way to do it in Kalamazoo or Portage or Parchment or wherever you live, don't think that you will ever accomplish it in Japan or Africa or Peru. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? 
We got to do it here, folks. It's got to start in Jerusalem. Home. Then our region. All right? Michigan. All right? And then America. And then the ends of the world. All right? That's what Paul had. And to make all seen what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things, referring back to that initial creation story, created all things through Jesus Christ. This is the big punchline here. To the intent. Now, this is the purpose, the intent. That now the manifold, the many-faceted wisdom of God might be made known by you, the church, by the people of God gathered together for a purpose. Right? Two, principalities and powers in heavenly places. In other words, what we're doing affects the spiritual realm. Amen. When we are the church, principalities and powers, spirit beings, the, the ruling influences in our, in our society and in the world, take notice. Why? Because people's lives are being changed. Right? So the principalities and powers in heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul reveals what, what, why he did uh, what he did throughout the book of Acts. <clears throat> the command to Adam to fill the earth and the promise to Abraham that in his seed uh, the, all the nations of the earth would be uh, blessed. That's all fulfilled in Christ Jesus. That was the eternal purpose that, that God accomplished in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, when he died in, on the cross and rose from the dead and obtained victory over sin and death, but that wasn't the end of the story. Okay? The next chapter is Acts, which is the church taking that message to the world. Right? And that story has yet to end. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Jesus commissioned his church, his body, to fulfill that same eternal purpose which is filling and ruling the earth as this one new man in Christ. Christians, redeemed in and for love. All right? So now we are the church. Okay? You are the church. Say, I am the church. I am the church. I am the church. I, am the church. I can't stand church. Well, I'm sorry, I am the church. <laughs> you know what I mean? You say it. I've been hurt by church. And you look down in the church and say, I am the church. Oh, shit. I am the church. We are the church. And you read through the Acts, you know, they had problems. Big problems. Fights. Divisions. But you know what? It was the purpose to go and win the loss that gave them a reason to stick together. Yeah. Right? And when you're, when you're working on a purpose that's bigger than you, then you're forced to overcome your deficits, your deficiencies, your lacks, your, your problems for a greater purpose. Uh, and that helps you. I mean, it's just the motivation. It's not just about you, but in one sense, it is about you because when you become who you're called to be, then you'll be, you'll be able to overcome all the things that are hindering you. So has God's purpose changed? No. It's the same purpose. You're standing in the garden. This is the same purpose. How am I going to rule the whole world? How could that ever happen? Noah coming out of the ark. No wonder he got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to go Right? Were his kids perfect? No. Did it change God's command? No. Abraham later. Build the earth and subdue it. Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus fulfills it and says, now it's your turn, guys. It's our turn. It's your turn. This is it. You don't know how many years you have. You don't know how many days you have. This is your turn. It's your turn to be one of those uh, 12 in Ephesus. Hearing this old guy talk about miracles of Jesus what faith can do, and how it's changed so many people's lives. Uh, <clears throat> how might this understanding of church change how we do what we do here? 
That's what I'm trying to do, man, as, as pastor. I'm trying to get this church to be more like this church. Okay? We're really changing our, our community, our Jerusalem, our Judea. That's why we have a church in, in Bion. That's why we have a church in Vandalia. Because we're stretching out a little bit. Is the church uniting the world? I see your head shaking and heads nodding. <laughs> I think it is. 170,000, approximately, people who study this, approximately 170,000 people that joined to the church today. Between 170 and 180,000, by best studies, every day, are baptized. Confess Christ. That's a lot. Okay? How many days does it take to reach a million? Who's good at math? Well, seven times 170. Thousand. Is that over a million? Yes. Every week, a million people. 50 million people a year coming into unity in Christ. So we see the world raging, wars breaking out. But that's just the surface. That's the that's the reaction of principalities and powers resisting this swell, this movement called Christianity. Yeah. That's purpose is to unite all mankind into one new purpose, one new person with a united purpose, with a single father, with a, with a savior, Jesus Christ. So in one sense, yeah, the real church, the Acts church, is reaching in the united world. Now there's factions within the church that call themselves a church that are divisive. We pray against that and we try not to be that. Alright? Really, God's purpose hasn't changed and He's sovereign He's going to accomplish it. How, how are you doing at following, following Paul's example? Who have you talked to lately? How can you do that this week? Pray into that. Book, learn from the Hatchels, the New Street Ministry. Read a book on it. Figure out a way. Pray. Ask God how you can be like Paul in his workplace, finding a way to communicate the gospel. Or in the synagogue, or in the streets, in the marketplace. How can we be like Antioch? Or Ephesus? As a church? You know, in, 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 in just two years, reach our whole region. Can you imagine? Everybody in Michigan. I, I, sometimes I'm driving through town, I'm like, how can we go to every house and count the zoo and share the gospel. There's got to be a way. You know? So we started with Vandalia because there's only 100 houses. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and we've been to every house twice now. Woo! <laughs> Boom! Yeah. With a meal, a gospel track. Awesome. And we went back and went up to the fish fry. And we're going to keep doing that. Because we're kind of learning how. But I'd like to do that in town with you. And, and maybe other cities too. <clears throat> what uh, might you be willing to do to fulfill your part of the Great Commission? Have babies. Raise them in the Lord. Okay. For some of you, that's your primary calling. For a big chunk of your life, that's what you do. Because you raise kids, teach them things, and, and it's hard to do anything else. It's hard to get to church. That's all right. You are the church. Okay? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and as you're able, you want to bring them with you. Especially as they're the young kids. They love it. They love to see it. So that's my challenge to you. What are you doing? What can you do? Let's prayerfully believe you more. Of course, it starts with your salvation. If you're in this room and you haven't come to a place where you've accepted Jesus as God the Son and died for you on that cross, uh, you could do that today. You can make that commitment. If you're here and you've made that commitment, but you haven't been living it, it wasn't genuine, you need to recommit. You need to recommit today. Because you don't know how long you have. And for those of you who are committed, that you said, I'm following this Jesus because I believe he is who he said he is. He's the Savior. And I'm buying into this vision of uniting all of mankind under the banner of love. And grace and truth that Jesus spoke of. <clears throat> then you need to commit to living it, to this outward journey of being the ambassadors for Christ. That's your purpose. And as you fulfill your purpose, you'll find that your problems 
are more solvable because you're united together for a purpose.